my name is Brian Berkeley with Fox Rothschild. Uh, I am a trade secret litigator. I've been litigating trade secrets for most of my 15 year career, 16 year career now, and um, tried the first case under the Defend Trade Secrets Act into a jury, as well as um, teach trade secrets at Rutgers Law School. Um, so that's by way of intro. Eric? Eric, I'm Eric Reed. Uh, I, I litigate alongside uh, Brian. Uh, we've been in the same firm for five-ish years. Uh, maybe longer. Yeah, maybe longer. Glad to be having fun. Uh, but I have litigated a fair number of trade secret cases over the years as well. Um, and one of the neat things about these cases is that you, you learn a different uh, substantive area every time, uh, even though this, the law is the same and the strategy is usually the same, the, the substance of what's at stake is always different. It's always uh, one of the things that makes it interesting for me. So I look forward to talking to you about recognizing some issues here and managing the risks associated with trade secrets. Ready? Yeah, so you know what, before we start through the slides, and we'll, we'll go through them just since this is being recorded, uh, but Eric, don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you have any questions or any particular issues that you want us to address around trade secrets? Um, the one that comes to mind immediately is, you know, de depending on the type of work that we're doing, and there's a specific example uh, right now, we are sometimes, um, we find it necessary to obtain a trade secret from one of our collaborators. And, you know, I mean, one basic question is, is there anything special that I need to do um, when it, with an incoming trade secret that belongs to someone else, but I need to protect it the, you know, as a trade secret? Do I have to do something above, above and beyond what we would ordinarily do um, for our own trade secrets? And then uh, the, the general thing after that is all the other guidelines that you're probably going to talk about is what, what is best practices for protection of trade secrets, especially in a large organization with uh, you know, a huge IT infrastructure and things like that. Yeah, well, we will. We had planned to talk about some best practices type issues. Uh, I, I think for your first line question, how you sh how should you be treating outside trade secrets that you have for purposes of your business? It's something that you're receiving from a business partner, I assume. Um, I, I would think that you that that would come to you by way of, of some kind of NDA or, or some other written agreement that would speak to how the party providing that information to you expects you to treat it. Is that accurate? Yes, it is accurate, um, except that it doesn't get into sort of the nuts and bolts. Right. Okay. Um, we have entered into agreements with, uh, you know, like car companies, for example, where they go to, they go at length uh, into the nitty gritty, uh, other agreements, uh, don't go into the nitty gritty. And many times we try not to take trade secrets if we don't have to. Um, and so this is a particular example where it's in the interest of both parties to, to take their trade secret or to accept it. And um, we just, I, I wanna make sure that we, we're doing all the right stuff to protect it. Yeah, I think that the specific nuts and bolts probably depends on the nature of what you're getting, but at a 10,000 foot level, yes, you ought to be protecting it as, as if it were your own. Um, and beyond that, you know, the specifics of it really depends on what you have. Um, and we'll talk about some high level best practices. And then, frankly, if you're the only one on this call, we can talk about uh, some perhaps a, a little more close to ground thoughts. Yeah, sure. I appreciate that opportunity. So, um, and and just full disclosure, I am not an attorney. Um, I just happen to deal an awful lot of stuff with on the legal side, um, with in-house counsel and outside counsel sometimes. Um, but I've been around the racetrack a few times, so uh, I'm not a complete newbie. Okay. Great. Um, so I see some more folks are joining. So why don't we go ahead and jump in? Uh, so. Uh, for those who just joined, again, my name is Brian Berkeley, along with Eric Reed, partners at Fox, and we're here to talk about trade secrets. So the first thing you see on this slide is discussing the value, value of trade secrets. So here's some, some numbers that, that give you a sense of what we're talking about. 
Um, oftentimes, uh, trade secrets are the most important uh, IP that a company has. It's the bread and butter of what a company does. And we see that time and time again with our clients, and that's why it's so important. And that's why also one of the more important numbers you see on here, you see the $1.29 billion in damages. Those are the, that's the number of damages, monetary awards provided by courts from 2016 through 2020 to plaintiffs who sought to protect their trade secrets. So that gives you a sense of what's at stake and the value that is at stake when talking about trade secrets and how important they are, the companies go to war over them. And all talking about that, um, that, that goes right into the risk, all right? So this shows, you know, we companies that were surveyed, we're talking about Fortune 500 companies, talking in particular with in-house lawyers, about a third of them have said that the trade secrets have been stolen in the last 10 years. Um, even though that, that's, so that's one in three. However, roughly one in three only say that they have adequate trade secret protection in place. Um, another important stat, 75% expect the risk of trade secrets to uh, theft to increase in time. And we both respectively think and others as well that that is going to just continue to increase post COVID and given how mobile folks are these days. Um, and that's because as the next data point shows, over 90% 90, 90 of loss comes from uh, insiders. And we'll talk about employees, business partners. And one perfect example of that is the Waymo case. Um, for those of you that may not know about this, this is a case where Uber self-driving uh, truck subsidiary, Otto was accused of trade secret theft from Google's autonomous driving subsidiary. This came up because a former employee of uh, Waymo uh, went ahead, went to Auto, and was a, a, a accused of stealing their tra uh, Waymo's trade secrets. Now, while Waymo, um, excuse me, going back real quick. Mm -hmm. While um, uh, Auto was um, maintained that it was innocent, look at the number there: two hundred forty-five million dollar equity stake was awarded to a Waymo in, in, in Uber, so in settling the case. So while auto maintain its innocence, look at that number, that's a large number. So this highlights the, the, the real risk that you have here. You've got insiders, employees that are gonna leave and the damages that are potential or the amount at stake could be hundreds of millions of dollars. So we've talked about the value, talked about the risk. Now we're gonna spend most of our time today talking about the solution. So there's gonna be really, there's two ways we've organized this, this presentation. First, we're gonna talk about pre-litigation protection strategies. Things you can do, um, and this goes a bit to your question there, uh, things you can do uh, before litigation to protect your trade secrets or protect yourself from being accused of stealing trade secrets. And then we're going to talk about what happens inevitably if there is a lawsuit and some of the tools available to you, um, particularly under the federal statute the Defend Trade Secret Act, which we'll go about into more detail in a moment. Um, but the tools that are available to you to protect, again, your trade secrets and also to protect yourself from any damages like what we saw in the Waymo case um, if you're accused of stealing trade secrets. So the, the federal statute that Brian just mentioned, the uh, Defend Trade Secrets Act, uh, does a few things uh, in broad strokes. One is that it defines at the federal level what is and is not a, a trade secret. Uh, and it can be any number of things, uh, but, but the key points uh, are that the information, and it could be various forms of information as you see here, financial, business, economic, engineering, uh, et cetera. But that information, key to it being a trade secret is that number one, it's actually a secret. Um, it can't be something that that's uh, uh, broadcast uh, to the public or otherwise available to the public. It's gotta be a secret. Um, and then in order for it to be a secret, uh, the claimant of that trade secret must actually take reasonable measures to maintain that secrecy. Uh, you can't, again, be broadcasting what you claim to be a secret out to the public. Uh, and then finally, whatever it is that you're claiming a secret uh, can only be a trade secret if it derives some kind of economic value based on it being secret. So uh, there are any number of things that might be valuable, but it's only going to be a trade secret if it's valuable because it's secret. 
And you'll, we'll see that play out in, in various different aspects on the topics as we discuss. Uh, again, some other examples, uh, source code, uh, designs, um, customer lists. These are kind of the things that, that Brian and I see most often get misappropriated in a trade secret litigation. Uh, I want to flag, uh, you see with the asterisk there, the, the know-how. Uh, under the case law, under the Defend Trade Secrets Act, and, and frankly, under many of the state statutes that have preceded uh, the, the federal statute, know-how can be a trade secret. Know-how is you, know, you hire someone who knows nothing about your business and, and you train that person and, and you are subsidizing the development of that person in your field uh, with the, the, teaching that person how to solve problems and, and generate um, solutions. That know-how, if it otherwise fits the definition of a trade secret, is something that can be protected. So let's talk a bit about what are not trade secrets. Um, as I alluded to a moment ago, something that's not adequately protected, that's not really maintained as a secret, will not get trade secret protection under the statute. So uh, an, an example, if you do not secure your data, if, if folks are allowed to take the data home every day without any kind of password protection or, or, or other protection, that could conceivably be challenged as to whether or not the data is actually a trade secret. Uh, if something is publicly available, if I can do a Google search and, and discover your trade secret, uh, that's not going to be a trade secret. Uh, if something can be reverse engineered, um, that, that is something that can also, uh, that, that, that's also something that would not be protectable as a trade secret. If I can buy your product in the store and take it apart and figure it out what it is and what's secret about it, that's not secret. Uh, patents also, uh, the, the trade off of a patent is that you are you publicly displaying to the world what it is your invention uh, what your invention is. Um, the trade-off for that is that you can't claim trade secret protection. That said, there may be some aspects related to what you have patented that might still be secret, but at least within the four corners of the patent, that would not be a trade secret. Uh, many employers use confidentiality agreements, uh, and those tend to be pretty broadly stated. That, you know, anything that you get within the course of our employment related to our business is confidential. That's probably going to be a broader definition than what would it would be protectable under the Trade Secrets Act, but there will be some overlap there. So one strategy, again, pre-litigation, things that you should be doing to avoid litigation or at best position yourself for it if it comes. Uh, one thing you might consider is it internally listing or recording that which you claim to be trade secrets. Uh, that but from a litigation perspective, uh, if Brian and I, if you were to come to us with a trade secret problem, uh, we're not going to be overly concerned as to whether or not you have an internal record of all of your trade secrets uh, and whether you maintain that and whatnot. What we're more concerned about is that you know what your trade secrets are and that you can demonstrate to us that you've done what the statute says you've got to do uh, to maintain the secrecy. So if, 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 if you were in a position that it was helpful for you to index it, great. You have to figure out where to keep it, how to protect it, how to secure access to it. Um, uh, but, but really what's most important to us is that you know what you have. Before you go, I, Sydney had a question. It, uh, yes, are trade secrets generally patentable? Well, again, the trade the, the trade off with a patent is that you, you're publicly disclosing it to the world. So it's possible that if, if something that would otherwise be protectable as a trade secret met the definition of, of what could something that could otherwise be patented, that you could convert that into, into a patent. I mean, it'd have to be something that, that, that there's a fair amount of overlap there, but certainly once you've undertaken the patent process, that some, that, that item is no longer going to be secret and thus would not be a trade secret. The other thing I would add to that, um, and there's different reasons why you would want to patent something versus trade secret. You keep something a trade secret if it can be a trade secret. But uh, the patent, the, your patent has a has a defined time limit to it. Trade secrets do not have a defined time limit to them, except as long as they still fit within the definition of what is a trade secret that Eric just went over. You keep them a secret. You've uh, engaged in measures to keep it secret, and there's an independent value that is derived from the trade secret by virtue of it being secret. 
If you maintain those three, you can keep that trade secret going on for an extended period of time. And I go back to the Coca-Cola example where they've kept their recipe under lock and key for over 100 years. Well, let's talk now about things that you should consider uh, to prevent misappropriation of your trade secrets, to, to prevent um, your secrets from walking out the door. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, confidentiality agreements are something that you might consider. Um, and there are various things here. I, I just want to flag a couple. Uh, one is non-competition agreements. That's not really the same thing as a trade secret issue. Uh, non-competition agreement is more akin to a confidentiality agreement, but essentially says that uh, uh, the employee agrees not to work in competition with you for a defined period within a defined geographic area. Uh, that may or may not implicate trade secrets. It's something that really works more uh, in tandem. Uh, and, and there's some, in some states, you can't even enforce non-competition agreements. I, I mentioned that just as a possible tool, depending on your situation. Uh, another thing to consider is limiting access within your system. Uh, the sales folks probably don't need to have access to all the engineering data and, and vice versa. Uh, and then one thing I really want to make sure you take away from this is that you need to understand when you are separating an employee, uh, either when the employee is leaving voluntarily uh, or, or when you are terminating that employee's employment, you need to have a system in place such that you will get flagged if that employee hooks up a flash drive and starts downloading all your data or starts emailing uh, all the data from the work email to a personal email. You need to know that that is happening and you need to have a, a process and a procedure uh, for that to flag and alert and cut down, shut down that access and, and, and track what has been taken. One thing I'd add to what Eric said, I'll go back briefly. First of all, what he just said is, is one of the most important takeaways from this slide. But the other point I'd make on the non-compete agreements, in those states in where non-compete agreements are enforceable, if you've got employees in those states that are going to be um, exposed to trade secrets, whether or not you've got them locked up on a non-compete is going to be an important thing. And I've been in cases where um, my client did not have a non-compete on an employee that left that was accused of taking trade secrets. And the court really, really thought, you know, took it, to, held that against my client and narrowed what we were able to do in the litigation. Because in that state, which was New Jersey, you could have a non-compete agreement. My client did not. The court, the court took that as an indication that they didn't consider the trade secrets as important to protect as they otherwise would have. So the other thing to consider, we talked a moment ago about limiting the risk of your secrets walking out your door. Uh, another risk to consider is whether someone else's secrets are coming in to your business. Uh, and something to consider as part of your hiring process is, is asking questions of, of your potential new hire as to whether or not he or she is, is bringing um, you know, documents, uh, and what kind of information uh, he or she might be, be bringing uh, from a prior employer, if any. Uh, certainly, that the, the depth of that analysis should um, be more restrict, restrict, restrictive and stringent. Uh, if that person's coming from a competitor, you need to know if that person is under any restrictive covenants, if that person has a, a non-compete or other confidentiality agreement. These are just things to be aware of. I, I flag the inevitable disclosure doctrine there because in some states still, even under the Defend Trade Secrets Act, uh, some courts are still following the principle that uh, some folks, by virtue of just their, their role in the former employer, cannot go to a competitor and, and, and be of any use to that competitor unless they would inevitably disclose trade secrets. So these are things that you need to have your eyes open on as folks are joining your workforce. Bottom two, two bottom line takeaways from this slide. Watch what documents your, your incoming employees are bringing with them, hopefully nothing. Um, and two, know what's in their head and how it got there and how that may relate to the other side's claim of trade secrets. So we've talked about what you can do beforehand. Now we're getting close to litigation, all right? So you've got um, suspicions that someone has taken trade secrets or you've got a cease and desist letter from someone saying, hey, so-and-so that you just hired is taking your trade secrets. So 
Here are the three questions you want to ask. Is it really a trade secret? What's the harm and what's the cost? Okay. Um, that goes both ways. So let me start with the port with the point of you think someone's taking your trade secret. Well, Eric's point a couple of slides ago is really critical. Do you, do you have in place on your software systems, your IT systems, a way to track what documents have been taken from a departing employee? You better, because that's going to form the basis of whether or not, A, you've got a claim of misappropriation that, hey, someone took something from you, and then B, hey, what they took, is it really truly a trade secret? You should be able to track what was taken. Um, all right, something was taken. Now you got to determine the harm. Was it really that important? This is a critical conversation that you have to have with your, your outside counsel or your inside counsel, which is, okay, someone took something. You get angry about it. It's upsetting. Was it worth it? It worth it, it was it valuable. Um, then there may be it may be valuable in of itself, or it may be valuable for you to send a message to the rest of your employee, you know, workforce. Hey, don't take stuff from us. And so maybe valuable to bring the litigation. But that leads to the last point, which is also critical. You should have a, 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 a complete understanding um, or as much of an understanding as you can about what it's going to cost to bring a lawsuit. Uh, that's going to be very, very important. Uh, because these things can get expensive very quickly, as we'll describe when we get to litigation. So that's the part if you're going to be the plaintiff, bringing a claim. Real quick, to flip it to the defendant side. Same analysis. If you get that letter saying, hey, so-and-so took documents, well, you should find out what if that person took documents, what they are, and whether it's a real trade secret. You got to determine, okay, is it worth having this employee or this party involved with us um, worth a lawsuit? And you know, I answer that question, you need to know what it's going to cost to defend one. So these questions flip both as a plaintiff and as a defendant. All right, we're now in litigation. We wanted to give you this slide to give you some data points uh, on how this has been developing over the years. So we picked 2017. Why did we do that? Because in 2016, the Defend Trade Secrets Act, which is a federal statute, um, that was passed. What does that statute do? Well, prior to 2016, the lion's share of these cases were filed in state court and were litigated under state statutes that prohibited parties from taking trade secrets. In 2016, uh, the Defend Trade Secrets Act was passed. It gave you some unique tools that we'll go over in a minute, but the biggest benefit they brought um, for us nerdy litigators is it allows <laughs> us to bring or defend these cases in federal court as opposed to state court. And what most litigators will tell you is that the quality of the judges and generally the quality of the judiciary is better in federal court than state court. And that's why you want to have these cases there. This stat shows that the claims, um, while they've held steady in 2017 and up to 2020 in terms of numbers of filed, it's gone up how many are being brought under the Defend Trade Secrets Act. The last point we have on this slide is, you know, we've all are dealing with COVID. We all know, you know, there's been a lot of different things that happened because of it. one of the biggest things. Um, one of the biggest thing that's happened is that employees have been moving around a lot more than they were before COVID. That has increased the risk for employers, both with folks leaving and both with folks coming in, that there will be some theft of trade secrets or a claim of a theft of trade secrets. And so I anticipate the steady case filing number will only go up over the next couple of years. All right, I mentioned that there's a tool that's available to you in connection with bringing a DTSA claim, a Defend Trade Secrets Act claim versus a state claim. And here's the one of the biggest ones. It hasn't been used a lot uh, yet, but it's there. And it's what it's called an ex parte seizure. I'm not going to go through all these different steps, uh, but what that generally means is that under certain circumstances, if you can meet the requirements listed on this slide, you can go into court right away without the other side being there and ask a judge to give you an order to seize any product that is, uh, um, is offending your trade secret. And I'll give you an example. Um, I had a case where a food product was accused of using the recipe of a competitor to, um, you know, to put out a competing food product. That competitor came uh, that was claiming it had a trade secret in its recipe sought to get an ex parte uh, seizure order to, to confiscate all or seize all of the offending food products off the shelves. So it's a valuable tool if you can meet these requirements. 
But the big, um, the biggest tool, and this is the most common tool, whether you're in state or federal court, it's the injunction. Fancy way of saying you say to the judge, "Hey, tell them to stop doing. Tell the other side to stop doing X." In this process, what happened with the trade secrets is you're saying to a judge, to "Tell the defendant to stop using our trade secret and return it back to us." Um, this is uh, the primary, uh, but not the only, but the primary relief sought in court um, on the short term when dealing with trade secret claims is because. You don't want your trade secret out there. It was, it's the value is in being secret. It's now cats out of the bag and someone's monetizing it as you speak. And the courts recognize that that's important to stop. And so they, um, they- You have, uh, you have a vibration. I, I don't know how to describe it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, but, the, um, but the injunction is going to be the most, one of the most important tools, if not the most important tool in the short term. So the cite the citation at the top of that slide, 18 U.S.C. 1836, that's the a, a provision of the Defense Trade Secrets Act, and what you see in quotes there are, are some of uh, the descriptions of <laughs> what uh, it can and cannot happen uh, under the Defense Trade Secrets Act. And, and one of the things that, that that you can't do is keep somebody from earning a living. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to be able to get an injunction that's going to preclude somebody from joining a particular employer. I can get an injunction that's going to essentially put that person on the bench at that employer and keep that person from um, engaging in certain conduct or perhaps working in certain aspects of, of, of that uh, new employer's uh, workplace. But I can't keep up some. I can't make somebody stay unemployed or, or, or be unemployed uh, by virtue of the Defense Trade Secrets Act. So let's talk about what happens when these cases start out. Uh, they usually come in pretty hot. Uh, you, you, we will find out that a uh, client learns that one of their employees has gone to a competitor and they may or may not have a record from IT that they, that person downloaded a bunch of materials on the way out the door. Uh, and so they'll come running to us and say, hey, we need to go get an, an order, an injunction to keep this person from stealing our stuff and get our stuff back. And what that typically involves is seeking a temporary restraining order. It's like an injunction, but for a temporary period. Uh, and, and, and that can go, you can go in, um, you know, they, they're not supposed to be easily granted, uh, but you know, if you can check all the boxes that you need to check, you need to show that you uh, are likely to succeed if the case were to proceed, uh, you'd be likely to um, be able to prove that there, you had a trade secret and that it was misappropriated by this defendant. Um, and, and usually if you can make that uh, showing the rest of these factors, reparable harm and whatnot, tend to fall into place. But the big hurdle that you got to get over is establishing to the court satisfaction, at least on the front end of the litigation, that what you have is a trade secret and your former employee uh, left. And then conversely, on the defense posture, uh, if you have hired someone who is accused of bringing something to your shop and you uh, do not believe that to be the case, you would have to uh, refute that kind of assertion. So the, the reference there to burning hot but not burning long, uh, usually, is, is that once you get through the injunction stage, and that can include people running to court, that can include some, some quick discoveries and quick document disclosures, uh, maybe a fast uh, a deposition on short notice uh, to, to get to the bottom of what's going on. But once you get through that, more often than not, than not in these cases, the, the, they're not long for this world. There's some kind of resolution to be reached once the parties establish uh, whether or not an injunct uh, uh, employee is going to be limited in what he or she does, or a former employee is going to be limited in what he or she does at the new shop. Uh, so one, one other thing to note here is that uh, in terms of cost, the front end, on the front end, these are heavy uh, and they're expensive. And in most cases, there's not going to be insurance for it. So if you're accused uh, of, of misappropriation, uh, your, your liability policy may very well have an exclusion uh, for trade secret misappropriation and trade secret type ca uh, cases, or even a, a broader exclusion for intellectual property theft. Uh, something to be aware of that could be, this could be where very well be an out-of-pocket expense, which is part of the reason why these cases don't burn very long. Uh, and to highlight that, I've been doing this for 16 years. Um, Eric has been doing it much longer, as you can tell with that gray hair. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, I have not had yet, I've yet to have a case that was covered by insurance that dealt with the trade secret theft. Right. 
So I mentioned discovery. Uh, there can be expedited discovery in connection with the injunction. Uh, once you get past the injunction, if the case is in fact one of those that will proceed uh, over the long haul and, and, and go beyond the injunction stage, uh, again, you're gonna have to prove as a plaintiff that what you have is a secret. And, and, and that involves all of the things that I mentioned earlier, proving that it has value because it's secret, that you are doing reasonable things to maintain the secret, uh, and, and some pressure points there are going to be, you know, what was your data security? Uh, could, could anybody hook up a flash drive and download the mother load? Uh, if, if so, you might have a problem uh, with, with, with the court. And the defendant in that case is certainly going to seek to exploit those weaknesses. So that's why pre-suit planning and, and, and pre-suit risk management is so important. So this, this slide demonstrates the breakdown of the damages, which we showed you in the very first slide, uh, how much damages have been awarded over the last four or five years. And so um, I think Eric, you may talk a little bit more about the royalty piece of things, but sure. I mean, we mentioned the seizure piece um, and then there's different categories you see to the left of kind of damages, okay. um, but Eric will highlight for you yeah. what the so this, line. Yeah, this is in relation to the Defend Trade Secrets Act um, you know, your damages, you, 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 it really depends on the situation as to what your damages are going to be. If someone has stolen your product and has taken it to market, you have lost profits uh, and, and you can get those back. So if your competitor has taken uh, and you can prove that your competitor has misappropriated your trade secret and gone to market with it and made money as a result, you can grab that. Uh, if, if you can show based on your books that you have an established history of profits and it suddenly knows that, once your competitor had started misappropriating those trade secrets, uh, th that would be a way to prove your lost profits uh, as well. Uh, if you can't really prove those, a, a fallback uh, approach would be to prove the money that you have spent and invested in your research and development. Uh, if you spent millions of dollars to develop this product, uh, but you perhaps haven't been out to market long enough to show lost profits, a, a theory of damages might be a recovery of the R&D costs uh, because your competitor was able to skip that cost and that whole process and go straight to market by virtue of stealing from you. And on that topic, if you can in fact prove that that misappropriation was willful, intentional, uh, you can get double those damages. Uh, and as you see in the pie chart there, uh, the lost profits, uh, the 258 million, uh, is a, you know, about roughly a little less than a quarter of, of the damages that have been awarded. But it's tough to say what all is in the, in the big red section there, the 606 million, uh, but uh, that, 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 that's a mix of, of various other aspects of damages. But you also see that there can be punitive damages. And you know, we address that in this next slide. Again, a, a citation to the statute, um, you can get reasonable attorney fees and other uh, uh, tack-ons, um, the, the, the multiplier that I mentioned earlier, if in fact you can show uh, willful or, or malicious misappropriation. We always get, as lawyers, we always get the question of, okay, I, I'm going to pay you, but, but am I going to get my money back? Am I going to get my fees back from the other side? And, and the answer is always, it depends. And, and with respect to uh, the, the Defense Trade Secrets Act, if you can prove willful or malicious misappropriation or that a, a position is been taken by the opposite side in bad faith. Um, you have a bad faith defense on the other side or a bad faith claim is brought against you, then, then yes, that is possible. Uh, is it common? No, it really isn't. So, so the bottom line takeaway for that, for those of you that unfortunately are finding yourself in a situation where you have to make a decision, a business decision, whether to litigate the case of your case, the legal answer is the one that Eric just gave you, the it depends question. The, or, it depends answer. The practical answer is no. You're more <laughs> likely than not, you're not going to get your fees. And so you should just go in understanding that you're going to be paying for it. It's not going to be insured, and you're likely not going to get it from the other side. So the last last uh, one of the last slides, I think this is our last it slide. It is our last slide. Uh, this is just an interesting chart that we thought uh, folks may find also interesting. Um, it's just a breakdown of the damages, uh, average damages awarded by industry. And as you can imagine, IT is, is by far the lion's share of the average damages being awarded. Um, and so uh, 
these are the industries that are that are at risk in particular particular risk and this breaks down where the numbers have generally been all right so we and we have uh, a little more time we actually got through this a little faster than and how we practice uh, <laughs> So uh, uh, it, we're happy to take some questions if you like. I want to I want to make sure you understand that this is this is not a private forum. It's a public forum. So I wouldn't be asking questions um, that that you don't want other people uh, to hear, and it's not going to be confidential. And and we're not at a point here where we're we're in a legal relationship either. We're not your lawyers. We're happy to be your lawyers uh, if you want to talk to us after, and, and and we can you know make sure that uh, it would be appropriate to proceed. Uh, but as of right now, we're not. So we can give you kind of high level discussions of what the law is like we've been doing. Uh, and, and with that said, I'm happy to, to take whatever questions you want to ask. The only other thing is we won't answer any questions about the date of those photos. <laughs> not recent. <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> the guy who can't turn off his phone. <laughs> so happy to answer any questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, Quick question here from Daniel Tompkins, um, and I, I had a question regarding the timeline of trade secrets. Um, as how do you, um, you know, it, how do you document that well electronically? Um, you know, my my uh, solution to IP concerns is to not digitize a lot of those because as soon as it's digitized, you've got a a uh, you know, a, a potentially vulnerable situation. Whereas, you know, the good old pen and paper really keeps things hidden pretty well. Um, but how do you document that then? It, it creates kind of a conundrum. Well, you, you can. Um, I mean, my, my wife is a scientist and, and they, they, they now are on electronic lab notebooks, but back in the day, that's exactly what they did. Uh, they they'd hand, hand write all their notebooks for all the experiments that they ran. Um, and, and that would be their record that they would use to go back and establish what had been done, what needed to be done, uh, and what would get turned over to the patent lawyers to, to write up a patent if appropriate. Um, I, I, I see no issue with going about it that way. That what makes it, that makes it a little more difficult from a litigation perspective in that if in fact you have a situation where you find out in the marketplace that there's a uh, a, a knockoff. Um, if someone has gotten to a point commercially that they only could possibly have gotten from if they, by, by virtue of stealing your trade secret, um, what you know, you call us. We're going to try to figure out how we go about proving that. And if we have to go back and look at years and years of handwritten notebooks, our, our lift is going to be a lot heavier than, than if you can, you know, pull out, extract. You know the few pages of your digitized record that, that shows us that you all were doing this way back then. Yeah, I, I think and, that's and I guess from a business standpoint, that's a hard document to to sell an investor on. Is hey, I've got this journal over here with the real secret sauce in it. So as much as we have our patents, the secret sauce is in the journal here. And you know why isn't this digit? You know they 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 kind of look at that like what are you doing? You're in the stone right. age, but right. it's, well, it's I, purposeful. You know, I, working in laboratories and stuff. That's how you do it. It's kind of an unstated undercurrent to everything that we're telling you here today is that your, your trade secret is probably your most valuable asset in a in a you know, early stage company, uh, and and that is what your investors are gonna are gonna care about. Uh, they're going to care about not only that you have it, of course, but that you're doing what you need to do to protect it so that you still have it, you know, five and 10 years from now. Um, but I, I could see investors, you know, if, you, if you're trying to pitch them based on your spiral ground notebooks from five years ago, uh, that, that, you know, maybe that's not as attractive a presentation as, as, as something else might be. Especially when you're looking at, okay, is this patentable because of the available prior art out there? That's the ca that's the category I put I kind of put things in is okay, this has prior art or it has, um, you know, complicated pa patent implications. So I put that in the trade secret file. I say, okay, I'm not digitizing that. That's the secret sauce. That that doesn't go down in a document into you know an executive summary or anything like that. And and that's that's always been a challenge for me. Um, I would certainly, is, yeah, is, certainly is, encourage you to maintain the separation from what you intend to patent between what you intend to patent and what you do not intend to patent uh, for the yeah. reasons I mentioned earlier. Yeah, exactly. And that's where the patentable stuff is all digitized. 
the non-patentable stuff, I don't, I don't even want to type it into my computer in a document, you know? Oh, so well, so it's like- is a different question from whether it's separate. Yeah, and the other thing true, I'd say- True, And the other thing I'd say is, you know, go, you know, we'll, we'll make this, this available to anyone who asks for it, this presentation. Um, the one slide that identifies, uh, you know, some common practices of protecting your trade secrets, use them. I mean, that, that hopefully will help minimize the risk associated with digitizing those trade secrets. And if you're going to monetize it and you're going to monetize it through an investor, you got to share it, right? Um, and it gets shared under an NDA, but it gets shared. So, um, they're going to want to look too to see what other practices are, do you have in place to protect it. So I would, I would just add on, you know, make a make a note in the slide deck when you get it, if you have, if you want it, um, on the part about com, you know common ways to protect your trade secret. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Anyone else? Well, thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we'll figure out how to get you the slide deck so people can get it to you or, or just email us. Our contact information is there. Yeah, I, I, I would say I would say anyone interested in receiving a copy of the slide deck um, should reach out via email to Brian or Eric and, and you, you guys can send the slides over directly. Um, I'll also say that uh, this recording will be made available on YouTube in like one to two weeks. You can check back then. Um, if you want to see it live uh, and narrated. Narrated. Nice. Narr yeah. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I see that um, Eric has unmuted. Eric, did you have a question? No, no. I was just going to say thanks. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Awesome. Nice to talk to you. Yep. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a great night.